Good morning, Nana. Good morning, Andrew. How are you? I'm doing fantastic yourself. Very well, by His grace. We thank God. We, it's, it's a real privilege hosting you in our studios this morning. I want us to kickstart the conversation because lots of people are interested in who Nana Kwame Bediako is. First and foremost, who is Nana Kwame Bediako? Nana Kwame Bediako is a young Ghanaian who is a Pan-Africanist, an industrialist, socialist, economist, entrepreneur, many more other credentials, but um, I serve the nation. Um, even before this journey, I've always been a great giver through my foundation, New Africa Foundation. And uh, through that, um, we built the freedom movement. And then out of the freedom movement came the new force. All this in one body. <laughs> Great. I mean, we know you are aspiring to, to lead the country, uh, but just before we get on to some other bits of the conversation, people remember that this interview is being streamed live. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and be part of this conversation. Send us your uh, thoughts. If you have any questions for Nana Kwame Bidiako, this is the right place to do it. Um, Nana, let's look at your, your leadership track record. Share with us what your track record is. Well, I mean, um, a leader is someone that will always have a vision. A leader will be someone that will always have a purpose. A leader is someone that have guts and uh, the courage to build a nation uh, or a generation. And I have, have these instincts right from the beginning. Even though that I wasn't a businessman in my youthful days, with my friends, I was leading them, you know. And when I say I'm leading people, it doesn't mean that people are following me. It means I can go down to earth to people to relate to them, you know, at whatever circumstances. And that's when people trust and believe in you. And that's what I see as the leadership skills that beginning of my life and going forward, you get to realize that you become responsible after some time. You know, um, that's where it really kicks in. Uh, are you just responsible for your family or you are responsible for social amenities and responsibilities? Are you responsible for a nation? Are you responsible for a country? Are you responsible for the nature that you came to meet? So I'm going through that kind of responsibilities and that is where my vision, my movement, my life is gearing towards taking care of what I came to meet here. Uh, you know, um, we've been following you uh, quite a, a lot, but um, and we know that you're um, enjoying some success with your business and all that. Why do you want to be president? You're doing well, you're serving the country, you're, you've done a lot, and you're still doing a lot for people. Why this bit to lead the country? Yes, I'm I mean, it's great to be successful for yourself. But sometimes when you want to significantly add value to humanity, it changes the dynamics and the perspective of life. Some people become successful. They can pay their children's fees, they can pay for their wife's cars, and they can buy themselves a home, and they can have a good business and be happy. But some people are not happy with these positions because generally they become responsible to people who are just liable on them, one, two, they are willing to give to the needy. Three, they want to make a change. And four, they want to leave a legacy instead of gain riches. I am that man. Mm. I am my destiny. Uh, my destiny is to leave a legacy. Uh, I've acquired riches. I have built wealth. But now I've entered the other door and I want to leave a legacy. And I also thought that the country is in in some shambles you know I'm worried about the youth who are coming and unborn children and that, that is that is where I want to come in and uh, so you help us with what specific gap you have identified uh, in this country that you want to fill it's quite a lot it's quite a lot mm. um, yeah uh, it's quite a lot so it's not fun when you become successful and then the millions around you are wondering how you became successful because there are no solutions to their problems and they don't see how they can climb the mountain as you did to get to where you are but these are circumstances beyond control if a country is not well governed the future and the hope of the people gets doomed 
Well, people, if you just tune in, that's Society LFM 100.5. And I have in studio with me Nana Kwame Bediako, uh, the leader of the New Force Movement here. Now, I am interested in when this whole idea of becoming president was conceptualized. Well, it wasn't until last year. You know, I was well about my going about my business building my industrial park, building my commercial buildings, building my um, uh, residential, and even got international, you know, such as the zoos and museums, the things that I wanted to do in the real estate sector, where I thought that people were not doing at all in Africa. Because when people say they're going into real estate, they just want to build a house and make profit. We were maximizing the use of the spaces to create profit. So it was a different dynamic that something else that we had to introduce in the real estate industry. And then from residential, we move into commercial. When we got into commercial, we realized that we could be the first people to introduce a different type of hospitality in the industry which is the uber homes they're like hotels but they're like homes and they're like apartments and where you can own one for a day <laughs> you know and feel like uh, very different but then industrial had quite um, a promising future for this country because we realized that there's less than six percent of industrialization in this country and even that six percent five point something percent belong to outsiders which means the nation itself didn't have industrialized minds. What, what what specifically will you be doing in this regard to change the issue? I mean, the issues around the the industry you talk about. Well, when I say industrialization, I'm talking of manufacturing hubs. You know, being able to experimentally. Um, fiddle and look into what we have as resources whether they're mineral or natural and then turn it around this is what creates jobs in the system in every country this is the strategy this is the secret behind every country's development this is what create jobs and we discovered that through real estate when we branched into industrial but that vision I had maybe 12 13 years ago when I started Petronia in, in the western part of Ghana. You know, um, for us, um, real estate has led me into different types of fields in understanding, but what really brought me into national governance is that I realized that the people I resonate with, the people I relate to, and the people that I look at the future with, I could only see the youth. I couldn't see the people who were far above me coming to buy properties from me. I couldn't see them coming to join me to build an industrial park. I couldn't see them being the ones that would turn my vision and my dream around. But I realized that the youth were going to grow into it and some of them will be smarter, wiser and even more skillful than me. And at the point where I'll be weak, they will be strong enough to take it off from there. Right. I, I, I want us to get to uh, these individuals you associated yourself with, you associate yourself with uh, I mean, a couple of uh, months ago, uh, Dr. Arikana of Zimbabwe, uh, Professor P.L.O. Lumumba of Kenya, uh, Julius Malema of South Africa, and uh, Peter Obi of Nigeria. Why do you choose these individuals to, I mean, as it were, associate yourself with? What do they have in them that uh, resonates around your vision and and what you want to push? Well, first of all, I wanted to clearly show Africans where we're diverting to. And two of the things that is so important in the African economy, not just Ghana, but the entire African economy, is our political governance, which is massively influenced by foreign influencers. Okay, so I took two very controversial politicians of all time. Julius Malema has been around for two, three decades fighting for his right and what he believes African politics should be um, should be constitutionalized as. Uh, you're talking of Peter Obi, who is a sensational politician who almost took the constitution to a different level in Nigeria and Nigeria is the highest population in Africa so it makes that guy very powerful to be able to convince the entire nation to follow him and then I took two activists these two activists also are the most controversial which is Dr. Arikana as you already know she turned her back on AU you know and UN 
and America by telling them that what you're doing to the people is not fair. You have to treat them fairly. You have to do the right thing to them. But knowing Patrice Lumumba, he has been lashing these leaders of Africa for the past three decades and they still embrace him. They still love him. They still respect him because he's speaking the fact. So I brought those four people to ignite the voice of Africa. You talk about uh, Patrick Lumumba. Uh, I want you to uh, pick your, your, your thoughts on this quote of his because we have engaged the reverse gear and we are moving with jet-like speed in the wrong direction. We must change this by rolling up our sleeves and working for the growth of our country. You share in this? I think he was just maybe talking about me. <laughs> 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 yeah, so practically, mm. as I was saying, I mean, these four people are, if any government, if you had the president of Ghana and maybe Nigerian president coming together to invite these four people, they would not show up. And I think that they didn't think that the new force and the new Africa Foundation had what it takes to bring these four people. Yes, we do. And I'm sure that it wouldn't just be the government who wanted to cancel this event. But of course, you would have other entities uh, such as UN, AU, or um, maybe um, uh, some of the other African entities. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the West African... Uh, uh, economic uh, platform called ECOWAS. ECOWAS? Yeah, mm. I'm sure they they were putting pressure on Ghana, you know, not to make these four people speak because if they spoke to 30,000 kids, which way they were going to, or more, it would have transcended to 300,000 and it could go to 3 million and it could go more and more and more. But you can't change the minds of the kids again. Now, now let's talk about this controversial one. Uh, you on record to have said that you're going to dredge the sea to the Ashanti region. Is that feasible? How? Yes, it's very feasible. But the, you know, the point that I was making mm -hmm. is not carrying or forcing the sea into Ashanti region. I was saying to Ghanaians that the time has come that we connect all our ferries, our rivers with the sea. It's called uh, canals. You know, you bringing water to a place is not because you want beach where people will go and throw their rubbish in like they're doing everywhere in Ghana. Um, I think that transportation, coastal transportation, is something huge that we're lacking in this country. And if we want speed in our development, how are we going to sit down and think that we are going to be bringing 500 of containers from Tamahabo, 400 kilometers away from Kumasi to develop Kumasi? And if we want to have a good economy, how would we think that if we put about five different plants in Kumasi for gold mining, for timber, for all sort of exploration, and manufacturing how are we going to export that out of Kumasi to other regions now let's look at the eastern corridor and the western corridor of this country as I've studied this grounds very well I'm, I'm not the type of guy that talks with degrees I am the man that talks with facts because I study things I look into things you know I study land policy and I learned about acquisition they didn't teach me in university or school now I'm telling you about the map of this country you have river Oti you have river Pra these two rivers are huge rivers and they're meeting Okay, they connect to Otano. River Tano is in Techiman. Techiman is the biggest cocoa producer in this country. I mean, they're the number one region that produces the most cocoa. This tunnel goes all the way to the Ivorian border and Ghana border where the sea is. So this is a simple dredging canal connection. And then you've gotten water flowing through the country. We need to open up the country. Everyone does it in their country. Singapore, uh, America, everyone. That is so, so So your point really wasn't necessarily digging. I mean, I mean, I mean, like people thought you're going to uh, start digging from one seaside towards the Ashanti region. Is that you, the need, point? you need water bodies. Mm. You need water bodies because they have the path already. Mm. It's called ferry. It's called, some of them is called canals. It's there. You Google it, you see. And it's that in na Hamburg. nature has already provided it. Yes, it's us. in Hamburg. Mm -hmm. It's in different countries. Even Manchester, they brought water there. You know, they, they dredge. And then they started bringing ferries with ships. 
it's very much possible. It's feasible. Right, great. Uh, people, if you just tune in, that's us ATL FM 100.5. My guest in studio, uh, Nana Kwame Bediako, uh, the, the leader of the News Force movement, uh, helping us to understand what his mission is, uh, what he intends to do, his ambition, and or oh, remember that uh, at exactly 2 p.m. Uh, today, uh, we are all meeting at the Center for National Culture uh, to meet uh, Nana Kwame Bediako, otherwise referred to as uh, Freedom Jacob Caesar. Uh, but because uh, you are in Cape Coast, I'm sure lots of uh, the people in Cape Coast will be interested in what plans you have for the people of Cape Coast. Remember that we have the fishing bit, we have people who are into farming, and most importantly, uh, schools. What plans does Nana Kwame Bediako have for the people of Cape Coast? Well, first of all, I, I think Cape Coast is one of the most beautiful regions on in the country even partly on the continent yes we can say so you have the coast going around the whole region first of all a lot of potential in development and tourism but i think this is the number one educational hub if not west africa for ghana we know for sure Okay, you have the best of schools here, you have some of the best universities here, you know, a very well designed and developed interchange community where people who are very much related to their history and their culture already, uh, apart from the the castle that is around that everybody comes to see, but you know, it kind of gives me some uh, downfall syndromes. That is one of our best. Why? Because why should we be so proud to show just that to the world where we got killed and where we were molested, abused? This is what we're showing people, you know, but this is what people come to pay for, to look at us. I think we should change our mindsets of what, you know, for me, I think it's memorial. It's good. But there's so much that we can talk about historically. The things that we have done, the greatest stuff, the greatest people from the Confanochi to the Yasan Tours to the Kwame Nkrumans to the great leaders of this country. You know, we need to talk about that. People that fought for us and gave us our rights back and pulled us together and made us stronger and pulled us from, from all the bad things that the, the, the colonial master was trying to portray. You know, it, there comes a time that we need to show people that we're made that we're built for it, that we're prepared again, that we're rejuvenated, that we have survived, that we're born again, that we have resurrected. You know, I think that is the kind of spirit that I'm bringing to the new society, the new Ghana, the new nation. You know, you can't show people your weakness. If I was ever having problems with finances, I would find, I would think about how to get myself out of that and make myself better and not fall in that situation again. I would not go and tell the world that I'm broke and I need money. That, you know, um, I, I, I know people uh, will be thinking: uh, Would would there be a time when Nana Kwame Bidiaku would decide to merge with any of these political parties at a point within your political career? I didn't come to merge with people. I believe that I came to establish what is right. A unification platform that unifies the difference between the youth, the government, and the public. The existing Joe Polly can do what they're doing, and I'm not here to complain about what they've done wrong. I'm not here to talk about their faults. I just think that as a country, we need to move forward. We don't have jobs. We don't have industrial platforms that would stabilize our economy we don't have money we have currency issues we have inflation we have deflation we have depreciation we have a lot of things that is going wrong with us and the people also don't have the jobs to go with it but education is ongoing everything that will make someone's future become bright is ongoing but everything that will lead you to that bright future gets stopped once you finish your education so i just think that we need a change we need a change and i'm not here to go and merge with any party because i think that with me and 
in that party, there will be a change. If they believe in what I'm doing at some point, they're welcome to join. I'm not someone that is going to discriminate any parties. If one day some good, learned, smart, young people, vibrant people are ready to leave MPP and NDC and join this new force and see that this is the best for our country and therefore we want to support it, they're more than welcome. But I'm not here to go and join any party. People, your liberty to get interactive with us, 275 14 49 49, 275 14 49 14. Alternatively, you can reach us via 0595 These are our engagement platform, both XMS and WhatsApp. This is ATLFM 100.5. Remember, we are streaming live via YouTube, uh, via our YouTube channel, um, TV UCC. Uh, get uh, interactive with us. Send us your message if you have any questions. I've got a message here from uh, Bismarck. Uh, thanks for writing to us. And uh, Nana Bismarck is asking that uh, you describe yourself as a socialist. And uh, his question is, what are you seeking to do in a democratic process like election? It d is that not uh, contradictory? No, it's not. Actually, I already think rather our constitution is quite contradicting us already. Um, and if you want to be socially adhesive and connecting with the people, the nation, the people of your country. If you don't find a democratic way to apprehend what you want to do, then of course you're going to end up becoming an activist where most people thought I was that type, you know, but I need the power of governance for me to be able to establish the vision that I have. You know, I need the power of, of social governance for me to liberate the public from whatever valley that they have gone into. So I don't see it as a contradictory at all. Uh, if Ghana was governed by something else and it was not going well, and I'm in the private sector and I decide to take a step, whatever uh, system or whatever platform that they would have had is what I would be gearing towards. And then once you are able to get into the constitution, you can review it. What's your take on the uh, Galamse menace? And uh, if Ghanaians uh, give you the nod, what exactly will you do to end this predicament? Well, first of all, I think that I would move all the Chinese out right away because they are heartless and they are hopeless to come into our country and to poison all the water. I mean, there are probably hundreds of thousands of them without us knowing. Because every is it is it not easier said than done? Well, well, I, just let me say it. Um, if they are in the country and we're not seeing them and they're poisoning our waters. Uh, these water bodies are the same water bodies that is feeding the grounds where we're planting our crops and everything. So we eat from this food and I can guarantee you 10 years from now, some of the kids that would be birthed would have six fingers. They'll be blind already because they'll have silence all in their system and it's poison. It's already happening. Okay, so now if these people are doing this and they're taking what we have and taking it to their country, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, all the waters are brown. Everything is destroying. The first thing I have to do is to stop them. Now, I'm not saying that Ghanaians didn't have galamzees already. That's how they were eating. Those people, I would like to bring all of them together. If it's 80,000 of them, I would like to hire them. I would like to employ them. I would like to know how they're doing that job. And I'll put them to a hard rock mining and I will give them a KPI that get me 200 tons in two years and we are going to pay you the money. Any money you want, we're going to pay you. That 200 tons for the first time, Ghana can borrow over 200 billion because what you need is gold reserves to borrow. What the country is doing that doesn't make sense to me or anyone outside this country is that you need gold to hedge your currency. They take the gold and sell it every day. They sell it to people and take dollars and then hedge their CD to the dollar. When the dollar, the guy that's giving you the dollar takes the gold to go and hedge their currency to make it stronger. So when you go to England, they have a lot of reserves and that's why their pound 
it's always strong. You talk about employing them or if you have a... I will 80, give them jobs. 80,000 uh, youth you're going to employ. I and, will give them jobs. And, and um, you know, we exist under a constitution. Uh, are you going to ask for uh, a review of the constitution? Because whatever they have to do with our land, our resources, natural resources has to, I mean, find itself within the confines of our constitution. Will and, you review and, the and, constitution? And, 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 and you was, it is not about reviewing the constitution. It is about jobs. It is about resources. These natural resources belongs to the state. It does not belong to the government. The people are entitled to make a living out of it. And if it's a region, they're supposed to. Are you telling me that in Takwa, there is a gold mine there, all of these things there, okay? These guys are mining tons of gold and taking it out of the country using our own people. You think those people don't know how to mine already? They will, they do, and they will do it. And I don't need right. to, mm. sorry, I know you, 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 you want to jump, but- I'm not gonna jump. Yeah, let me, let me just to. make sure that yeah. you're, you're corrected here. Mm. What well, the point I was making is that you need to make use of your human resources, of your mineral resources, and then use that to build your country, to build your people, to build your economy. These three things, if you don't do it, your people will become valueless. If the nation has valueless people, economy doesn't exist. Okay, if the nation is taking every money out of the country to buy things from outside China, everything, your economy will never have a balance. It will not grow. Great. Okay, so all of these things that you're saying, I think that I can turn it around, but I don't expect Chinese people to be here extracting from us. I think they should work for us as a country. Right. Um, so, I mean, since or post independence, uh, Ghana has uh, subscribed to the IMF uh, uh, for some bailout of assault uh, the 17th time uh, if Ghanaians uh, give you the nod what will you do to as it were stop this consistent visit to the uh, IMF for bailout well I think it's also based on people's personal interest borrowing money from outside is never going to build our country we cannot borrow even 50 billion and use it to build all our roads and give it to every Ghanaian to ha that doesn't have a job or have a job to be paid it wouldn't take even a year and all the money will run out okay um what i think we should stop doing is going to people and begging them for aid and we should start giving ourselves the aid that we need to build ourselves, which we already have. As you see with the policies of New Force, one of the main things that we're starting with is the 16th Industrial Regional Revolution, meaning that we're going to put businesses, platforms, industrialize every region. Because of that, we have studied every minerals that the deposits of attributable reserves in every region. These regions that we're talking about, some of them have over 1.7 trillion reserves. It's on the ground. From gold, oil, uh, bauxite, manganese, it's all there. These are deposits. When you look at it, none of them are being manufactured, refined, or industrialized. We are trying to make sure that the 16th region becomes active. Active that every single person that is on this on this land of this nation, if they ever want a job, there is room for it because we're going to refine our own resources. We don't need to go out there to borrow money. We need to make money out of what we have around our surroundings. And we need to be able to even export it to the outsiders. Because if we're only importing goods into our country, then we're sending all our money out to the people that we're importing from. And then, trust me, the people will come back and sell, all the, sell these things again in Ghana and take it back to wherever. The money is going into other people's economy. Until we industrialize our country, we will not move forward. It's as simple as that. And I want Ghanaians to understand this. This is how America was built. This is how Singapore was built. This is how Dubai, any country, that that even Dubai is a good example that has been built within 46 years. And this is maybe two thirds of our independent time since we had independent. They have built a whole place, over three million apartments, buildings, everything, and it's become the center of the earth. Everyone is passing through there and they are living very well. I mean, their future is already built. Ghana has that potential to be one of the first developers of their own country in Africa and start this African industrial revolution. That's what I'm geared for. I'm ready for something. I, and I'm telling the nation that Africa, Africa's industrial revolution is coming. It's going to be 
the biggest thing. It's going to be the third world biggest thing. The first was farming and it was big. The second has been technology and it's big. The third would be Africa Industrial Revolution. What, what has been your inspiration about this whole Africa thing? Uh, you talk about Africa. What, what inspires you? What gives you that kind of um, inner belief in Africa? And what do you want to do for Africa? Well, first of all, I mean, the Prince of Africa is really stunning for a continent, a continent that has been well undermined, you know, with their capacity and their ability. And Nana Kwame Bediako is the Prince of Africa. Of course, Freedom Jacob Caesar, you know that. Nobody else claimed the title I did and God put the crown on my head. And no one is taking it from me until I become a king of that, until I become an emperor. I want to, you know, I've, I've lost some great people. The likes of Gaddafi, the likes of Kwame Nkrumah, the likes of all these great leaders of Africa. Their spirit dwells in me. They live in me. I feel them and they feel me. I understand where they were taking us. I understand what the value that they created within the land that they belong to. The resources, they turn it around. Of course, the Western didn't like that. And the Western would not like this young man sitting in front of you, Andre Boisiaku. But I'm telling you for sure that I'm here with a purpose to make that difference. I know that we are wealthy. We are rich. We surface the earth. And we are the reason why a lot of countries in this world is built without us there will be a lot of problems and i know that you know the world needs all the lithiums and the cobalts and the oil and the gas and the gold and the things that we have but we have become victim to our own wealth we have become slaves to our own wealth because someone takes it from us polishes it and come back and sell it times three and then have us begging for him to give us money to buy what really belongs to us that is just refined when we can just refine it ourselves hmm. and buy it for a cheaper price and sell it to the world. Good one. Um, so people, if you just tune in, that's a ATLFM 100.5. That's a, a special edition of the Atlantic Wave and we transmit it live from the Kofi Toto Bikwachi Studios of the Campus Broadcasting Services Center here in your number one university. Let me just put this across the leader of the new force, the Nakwami Bedia who sits uh, before me this morning, also known as Freedom, Jacob Caesar. Uh, I have the code for success. Mm. Of course, no one can teach you how to become rich, but I have the code for you to become successful. Be there tonight, uh, after 2 p.m., uh, going to the Center for National Culture, I'll be coming to the university. Um, Do you know the auditorium? Where we will be? Maybe you should get another and... Neck, All right, so neck, at, neck uh, uh, auditorium, yes, uh, the new examination set yes, here yes. In, in your number one university. And you do know that the University of Cape Coast is the number one university in Ghana, number one in West Africa, and amongst the top 10 universities uh, in oh. Africa. So we pride ourselves. So you are in the right place, Nana Kwame. Thank Bidiaku. you, thank you, Andrew. All right, so uh, let's let's move on to issues about uh, monetization because um, uh, 2024 is an election year um, and there are issues about voters exchanging their voting rights for money um, I mean MPs, lots of people within the political circles, I mean, paying people to vote for them. Uh, what's your take on that and what concrete concrete measures are you going to put in place to, as it were, end this so people will vote based on competence and not about who has the money? I think first of all, people are selling their souls for political leaders. I'm not a politician, I'm a leader. You know, and what I'm seeing from where I sit, your thumb is a very powerful thing for your fingers. When you don't have it, you can't do a lot of things. When someone comes to you and offers you money so you vote for them, so you can put your thumb on something for them, okay, that's your fingerprint. They're taking a part of you, a part of your soul, okay? When they become a president. They can use you, rob you for the next eight years, but you both have sent. You know, you wouldn't be classified as you've just been cheated. You both have sent. Okay, now let's compare the Western democracy to the African democracy. In Africa, when someone wants to become a president, he goes to the people, and say, here, take money and vote for me. In the Western world, when someone wants to become a president, he goes to the public and say, here, I want to become your president. Please, donate. 
so I can be a president. Now, what happens is that when that person becomes a president, the people that donated to him, he owes them. So he has to make sure that they're okay. That is naturally, mentally, and spiritually. Now, when you switch it back to Africa, when that person becomes a president that has given you money to vote for them, you have to remember now you owe that person. So millions of people will be owing one person, and he's going to take the money back in a thousand votes, which is what almost every politician is doing in Africa. So they therefore don't think about the people or think about developing the country, the responsibility of develop, building the nation. They're not doing it. They are taking their money back and preparing themselves for the next election. This, I think it should be changed. New force have come to do that change. And I would not pay people to go and vote for me. And I'm not interested in people who are also interested in bribes. I think they've lost their path. I think they've lost their way. I don't want them to be my followers until they fall back into the place where they belong to. I really believe that they're the youth, they're the up and coming people of the future. Do, do, do you think the country needs a development plan because as it stands, uh, different political and as a country so that irrespective of whoever sits on the throne, we direction? I think they have a, develop, a development plan, but it's not implemented and utilized right. What I think we need to do is to actually change the constitution in such needs to continue from there. So we, we keep going backwards to think that this other party started this and then we move all of these people away because they just want this party. So this country is being governed based on the party's interest, not and the good ideas, great vision, strategies that has been implemented should be continued. The ones that are beneficial should be supported. The ones that have failed should be tried again with a better solution. And we should be one. We should think towards a plan have bridges everywhere. You know, you expect to have, you, first of all, we need to start to industrialize our petrochemicals so we don't have to buy bitumen from outside to do our roads. If we're doing bitumen here, it will be cheaper. We have the stones, we have the concessions. We can build six lanes if we do that. And that six lanes is going to give more jobs in the country. And instead of paying $1 million, we can pay a quarter or a third of that. It's called economy of scale. You know, when you're doing investment and development, which is my forte, that's what I do. My business is investment and development. And what I'm doing in the development is making sure that I multiply the use of the spaces into many spaces. So like some of my developments is one and a half plots, but I managed to put 108 apartments there. That's where my profit is. Okay, the maximization so I think that this country needs a leader who understands investment and development very well. Okay, a CEO that will come and build country, build a country and build businesses for people and build, bring jobs for the people. Now, I want us to talk about free SHS or the issue about uh, SHS uh, or the free SHS policy. Uh, lots of analysts have raised concerns about the quality of education in the country. Uh, some have called for a review of the free SHS policy, feeding oversized uh, classrooms and the like. Your take specifically on the issues about free SHS. I think it's a good idea, but the government is probably not ready for it. Because if they don't they're have, not ready for it? No, nah, if they're borrowing money. From 2017 till now, how many? Uh, well, I mean, if you, at? you can tell that a lot of the people are not using their time properly in the full semester anymore like it used to be so the pattern of education is changing but the educational curriculum should be suitable to the traditional developmental scheme of this country that will benefit the people who are educating themselves so you might have free HSS, SHS but uh, it will not benefit the nation to the extent that we're looking for that free education. I think a country's economy should be booming and strategically tax tax money, uh, the tax returns of the country. There are other things that can support the system. I think currently, as a country, Ghana, we're struggling <laughs> to do so. So if, if it's two million people that want free education, and even if you have to give them a mail, a day and it's even five cities that's a lot of money that the country would need to put in the educational system i think they're struggling and when you're struggling with education you are not focused 
you know the people are not focused you know when your mom cannot pay your fees properly you know and you are brainy uh, and you have to write on exams. That's it's a like, trouble. Yeah, yeah. It's likely that you might not be able to perform your best. So I think personally, um, our educational system, first of all, is quite wrong for me, and that's my opinion. I'm entitled to it. Uh, I think we're still learning about Christopher Columbus and Westerners' histories and all of that, which is not very important. I think we should learn about uh, around our surrounding, <laughs> you know, things that is around us. Uh, we should be educated about how to mine, how to manufacture, you know, how to go into farming, agro processing, you know, all of these things that when we're growing up we grew up like the Chinese you know they, they go to school but they learn about how they can turn a clay to a towel you know and all of that so they, they all have industrial mindset and that mindset is going to uh, give birth to a skill set that would be transcending in, in, in within regions and, and the nations. So, uh, first of all, that tweak about our educational system needs to be implemented ASAP. Mm. ASAP, change of some subjects. You know, let's get some thinking subjects and some local uh, analysis. You have that any you have thought about? Oh, yes, I probably wouldn't like to share it here. Okay. Um, yeah, just so uh, nobody in the Ministry of Education would take it and make themselves look good. But uh, yeah, I do. I you, do. you would be helping the country even before Ghanaians give you the nod? Well, I do, and I, I probably I am doing that already. As you see, we are doing the university challenge. That's why I'm also doing the university tour, the success story. So me giving one million to the winner of whatever university out of the ten universities that we chose, which I, uh, CCU is one of them. It's because I I wanted to one, one one million is ambiguous. What are you saying? Yeah, one million. What one million cities. Ghana cities. Yes. Great. Yes. So it's because the winner is going to use that money and it's a group of people. They're going to use that money to turn around the business that they wrote the proposal for. Even if it's government, we still give you. So we, we had we had different topics that people are going to write about, present and everything. And I'll tell you why we did this, because we wanted to create entrepreneurship, wealth building and empowerment. These three things we want to introduce into the universities because we've realized that the universities are going to, they're spending four years of their lives only because they think they will get a job after. They don't come out of university as business people, as leaders, as entrepreneurs. We want to create that. We want to put that in our curriculum. Just because you touched on uh, students and universities and schools and what they intend to do with education, they want to move out there and get jobs and all that. That's, that's a common assertion about the discrepancy between theory and practice. And so the conversation is around bridging the gap between what students study in school and finding uh, finding the job market i mean finding jobs to do uh, what exactly would you to uh, would, would you do to merge these so that what they study will make a lot of sense in the outside world as in they will find the right jobs and don't study a or study a square peg and then find themselves in the round hole that's exactly what I just told you, basically, mm -hmm. that that's what we're working on, you know, because practicality needs some sort of um, networking group team to work with, you know, push you, you know, so you can see the essence. Yeah, so I, I actually heard you say that, but I, I my, my interest is specifically what you would do, unless you do not want to share, but what you would do specifically to be able to bridge this gap because well, governments have tried oh well, it's very simple um entry boy circle i mean look you've been to school i know you have you speak very well but um you remember your grammar more so than you remember your courses <laughs> you know if i ask you what is economics you probably fumble if i ask you a lot of things you studied in school you you won't remember but you remember the faces of your friends and you're still connecting with some of your friends so networking is very important in in in, in your educational life okay that's one 
two, uh, skill adaptation is very important. What skills did you adapt from people? Because sometimes you might look at your prefect and you like him so much that you ended up becoming a president. You know, you took your leadership skills from someone and you used to be with this person for seven years. So you get to learn from them. You spend eight hours of your day with people, with teachers, with people in your class. You definitely adapt from them. What we don't seem to realize is that we actually spend time with people that we work with and people that we school with more so than we spend with our families because we only meet our families at night you know and we don't get to spend more time so the people you're spending more time with are the people you're going to adapt from and therefore if five of your friends are foolish you end up becoming the sixth one if five of your friends are millionaires you end up becoming the sixth one if five of your friends are wise people you end up becoming the sixth one we need to understand that is our educational platform surrounding us with these wise people, with these business-minded people, with these industrialist people. That's what we need to put ourselves in. But if we're just going into classrooms and lectures, and then we're just studying and chewing and pouring whatever we're chewing and pouring, and then we score AAA because that's what makes everyone happy, it is not like that in a real world. You cannot chew and pour and get paid. You need to use a fear answer practically. Make sure economically you're smart and you're wise. You can't go to the real world with just being smart and you can't go to the real world without just just being wise you can't go with one of them you need to be clever and you need to be smart in the real world practically you need to make sure and understand that time is the measure of money so so he, he's basically talking about how you're going to select the people around you most importantly uh, ministerial appointment and over mm -hmm. the years there have been issues about these appointments yeah it's just how you manage the people and how you let them operate so your vision and your destiny is prevailed through these people but you just have to remember there's always going to be a judas you just need to make sure that that judas is useful I mean, I'm sure Jesus Christ, Judas was one of the most important uh, people for him in, in all his disciples. He definitely knew that this guy is going to play me this way, but when he does, I will become the Christ of Messiah. And at the time that he did, yes, he resurrected. And today, if Jesus Christ is a marketer, he's the best marketer for me because after he left, everybody believed in God. You know, so there are bad people in, in our society that they will end up entering your space. But sometimes we need to find a way to adjust those people and gain from them, although you're going to depart from them. You know, this shouldn't be the reason why you are falling. You know, you should know where you're going, what you're doing, and even if one or two people are wrong, you still make sure that you go there. And I think this country is lacking accountability, okay? Responsibility. Now, all these leaders and all of these ministers and workers and uh, public servants have become a liability to the government system. Everybody's they just have getting, become a liability. Yes, a liability because the state have to pay them. And you know we have uh, all the institutions mm -hmm. that are supposed to check corruption and all that, but we still experience the uh, highest level of corruption. But that's what I'm talking that. about. Exactly the liability. your point. I'm, yes. I'm just I'm just adding it. But what you will do to, as it were, uh, make these institutions work and work to the letter. I think first of all we need to go back right to the roots where the problem is growing from. Okay. Have you identified the Well, yes, you have to. And uh, I'm not fully in a system, so I can't pinpoint it. But it's very clear that if the top is corrupt, then the middle will be and the bottom will be. So the whole country is rubbing Peter to pay Paul. Really, that's what's happening. Maybe someone in the Lands Commission is stealing something, is taking some money on the side, someone in the police, someone here, the government, maybe the ministers, the leaders, people are going to England, they're taking this. So everyone is stretching their hands out and it's become a sickness around. So corruption is really have eaten into our blood. But if you come and you blame and you find excuses why you have to... Uh, uh, incriminate people and jail them and this and that that's not important I think what is important is first of all finding solutions to problems because that's a step forward okay that makes people sit a little bit and then secondly planning of how you can add value to whatever existing product existing minerals existing human resources that you have for us to also take another step forward I just believe in taking steps forward forgetting what has happened in the past but learn from it give up on the past but 
learn from it Great. and go forward. Great. People are still have in the studios with me, uh, Nana Kwame Bediako uh, Freedom, Jacob Caesar, uh, the man who is the leader of the uh, New Forces Movement, and he calls himself, or he uh, says that he is the Prince of Africa, and so uh, he's in the studios now. If you have any questions, you want to know his vision, he's touched on a lot of them. Uh, um, I, I just specifically would want you, and I want you to uh, touch on the e issue about unemployment. You have touched on a host of things you're doing and what you intend to do. Uh, but beyond these, uh, it looks like unemployment is a canker within this uh, economy. What you would do beyond uh, all that you've said to help address the issues and bring it to a final. Uh, okay. So, I mean, what we're doing, what we're doing with um, our listening tour, we've been to Tamale. We started from Tamale. Uh, we listened to the people. We went to Bolga. Then we went to Goso, Techiman, Sefi, Uelso, uh, Kumase. And now we went to Takradi and now we're in Cape Coast. So we covered about eight um, region so far or nine but we went to Sunyani as well but we just didn't do a listening tour there because the king is dead may he so rest in peace so we went to donate and uh, of course we have to attend the funeral at some point so what we have done the statistics in the research that we're doing because the listening tour is what is helping us to finalize the manifesto of this country and we want the next manifesto of this country to be the people's voice what they want what they're asking what they think can be better for them and we realize that 63 to 69 percent is unemployed so it's growing by the time we finish the tour it that could is be indeed a national security threat it is big it is a it's a it's a state emergency it's 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 a big thing it's a big problem and we realize that it fits right into our vision because our vision the first thing that we have to do is to industrialize the entire country so the 16 regional uh, industrialization fits into this where we're sending food processing plants we are creating power plants energy in every region the regions are very 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 well they're very very powerful in terms of wealth so we've checked like uh, western region for instance is 1.7 trillion you have about 28 billion in Volta region. You had there are different numbers that we calculated, and when we put everything together, we're talking of 4.7 trillion mm -hmm. attributable reserves in the country. So once we're able to create a value and uh, an industrial platform in every region, automatically the jobs will be created for the people because it's not the shops that were buying the trading goods that will bring the jobs, which is what almost everyone is doing in the country. It is the factories. The factories will be working 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. Eight hours times three is three shifts. So if you employ 10,000 people, automatically it has to be times three. Then you have 30,000 jobs. It could be one or two plants. This is what we want to do in all the regions. Great. If you times it by 16, you are looking at at least increasing between 500 to 1.3 million jobs in the first two years or first three years if we're able to put at least 32 plants in the country. So I'm going to pick your final words. So you speak to the people of uh, Cape Coast uh, uh, through our media here that we are wrapping up the conversation. But somebody is asking, how can I contact him? Uh, because I, I am indeed loving everything about about him and I want to be part of uh, this whole movement. Yeah, you can just contact us um, the Nana Kwame Bidiako website or the New Force website. There's a call center there. It's all different languages, Gachi, English, um, all the other regions, you know, uh, we can connect with you. Uh, you can be at the event tonight at the Cape Coast University or at the Center for National Culture 2 p.m. Uh, to talk to me. Um, if you want to ask me questions, you can be there. Uh, you can also join the movement Movement. It's very easy on our website, www.newforce.com.gh. Uh, um, Nana Kwame Bediako as well, you can join us there. Uh, also, we have an app coming up that is going to be talking about the African heritage, value, wealth, and everything. So, yeah, I am accessible for the nation now. Right, your, your final words in a minute. Well, I just want to say thank you very much. First of all, and Tribu Asiako and the team and ATL FM, this has been a great interview. Alaji, thank you. I've 
seen that you've passed on a lot of uh, paper. Some of the I was still waiting for some questions, but it still didn't come. It's okay. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you to you guys, and I want to tell the people of Central Region that this is also one of my favorite regions. It's very well designed. The people are warm and. Um, I'm happy to be here and I want to tell you this that the new force is here to stay we are the new Africans the new nation the new Ghana we are here to make sure that all the sets all the traps and all the issues that have been colonized and influenced our ways of living will be deprived as time goes on we are building a new economy for the nation and you are part of it thank you very much for having me in Caicos and I'll be coming back again for the 275 constitutional tour that would be my main campaign I started with the 16 I'm going to listen to everyone I'm going to go back to the lab with my team I'm going to put everything together and now I will come to you and I will go to every district in this country of course I want to feel the pain of the people I want to know what they're going through I want to see deep down the roots the grassroots what is going on there because truly i'm here for a purpose to help to add value to my society i'm here for legacy and help me build it thank you just before i let go of you i, I know you want to listen to this i've just got this message my regards to the inspirational goals and results oriented cheddar um, and i hope and pray that the youth of ghana find wisdom and his great ideas and vision cheddar is simply a great visionary leader uh, 